Where is Connecticut School of Broadcasting? So, Connecticut Schools of Broadcasting is a... Um, a little coaster, thank you. It's an affiliate, I guess, school. They have them, like, branches all over the Northeast, and it's more of, like, a trade school. Okay. So, um, you're learning everything hands-on every day by radio uh, hosts. So, uh, that's that was, like, my first stint out of uh high school right like and did you enjoy it i I fucking loved it because you know for me i'm not like trying to boost my own but i feel like i'm a person that's learns by doing yeah uh school was not (laughs) for me i was very uh add and i didn't think about like so it's a crazy long story, but like, you know, 9-11 happens and then, um, yeah, I'm old. So 9-11 happens. And I, I, I remember 9-11. Don't no, know. but like that's when I was g- graduating high school. So doing the math. 2001. And now I'm doing the math. Now yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, f- um, so then I was, I was planning on maybe going to Israel because that's where my family is from. Or that's where I'm from originally. And obviously after 9-11, I was like, eh, let me stay around here. And I started going, I was like, all right, let me find something that'll ring with who I am instead of just wasting money. Yeah, a little resonance. Yeah. And uh, I've always wanted to like be in sports broadcasting or like be involved in sports on some facet. And my athletic ability wasn't really the way I was going to do it. Um, hence why I, I'm good at jujitsu because you don't have to be athletic to be good at jujitsu. <laughs> Let me just put everybody on record real quick. He is good at jujitsu. He beats my ass every time we roll. Well, no offense, just a white belt. Yeah, it's not it's not that hard, right? <laughs> he's like, oh, he's still doing this dumb shit. Okay, right. <laughs> flip. <laughs> exactly, but you'll learn over time, you know. Yeah, and and your athletic ability will make it helpful for you to get better leverage in certain situations where I'm a big guy and I have to like really use my strength, but like wedging myself under someone where you're a little smaller, a little more athletic, you can get on. I'd say it. I'm short. <laughs> you are short, <laughs> shorter than myself. I'm I get, I, it's, it's a good connection with the elbow to elbow to knee. I'm, yeah. I'm, 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 real, I'm real tight like that. <laughs> exactly. So anyway, so go, so I started doing that and then uh, I really enjoyed doing that. But there's no money in broadcasting, like in the beginning of your career. Yeah, it takes years and years. Yeah. I mean, how long did it take Howard Stern to really start making oh loot? He was, what was he working at? The, yeah. Some shitty radio station? So many up, shitty. Upstate New York yeah. or something like that? Detroit, upstate New York, I'm sure Washington, D.C. he did, I remember. So, you know, it wasn't really for me. And at the time, my mom had actually moved to Mexico to work for a huge uh, jewelry company. And so... She's like, come down here, make some money, take a break, you know, from the industry, I guess, because obviously it's very stressful. Um, My house was being sold at the time, the house that I grew up in. So I was like, all right, let me give it a try. So I went to move to Cozumel, Mexico. And uh, at 19, I was selling jewelry, like $10,000 pieces of jewelry to people coming off cruise ships. Um, that authentic jewel, like real, yeah, like real pieces, diamonds, Tanzanite. But that was always honestly. Everywhere. That was always my question when I see those spots, like at the touristy, off the cruise ship type spots. Yeah. Is the jewelry real? That's what I always. My dad bought a Bama Mercier watch in the Bahamas. Yeah, and he and I have it. And every time I look at it, I go, I don't even know if this fucking thing it's is probably real. real. Okay, yeah, most of those are sort of come with a certificate of authenticity. So I did that, and then I was like, all right, this is. Mm, you know, it's kind of like a fun lifestyle because you're living in Mexico. You're in your, you know, t- turning 20 and there's a lot of young other other people around. And, <laughs> you know, Carlos and Charlie's and Senior Frogs every day. So Where are you going with this story? <laughs> <laughs> so you, you, you learn to like adapt to the situation, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, I think. And you um, probably had a great tan all the oh, time. Oh, dude, it was great. Looking so, cinnamon. Yeah. So adaptation is is my biggest strength, I think. And uh, so I there was a lot of the company was owned by uh, Israeli family. And so one of the cousins was around my age and he had traveled. You know, after the army, a lot of Israelis 
like the the kid they'll they'll decompress by going to travel around the world. It's very popular, you know. You're going and you're serving in the military, and then you want to go and see the world a little bit before you start your education. And so, all these guys that were a group of friends from Tel Aviv, Israel, had come to live in Cozumel and work at the company. So, when I came, it was immediately like blending in and being able to like make friends. And it, I wasn't really speaking Hebrew as much growing up here because most of my friends obviously spoke English, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, it allowed me to re, uh, rework my, my verbal skills in Hebrew. And so one of the general managers in an area called Costa Maya, he was like one of my neighbors in the complex we were all living in. It was literally like, um, Melrose place, like an outdoor complex. Everyone's in there early 20s and 30s and like you walk outside you get on your scooter you drive to work and this is in mexico yeah in cozumel beautiful the most gorgeous island you'll ever live on it's i visited cozumel on a cruise one time but i was young yeah. I didn't really get to like actually yeah. understand it or, or really see yeah. what it was like you know all i remember is super blue crystal blue yeah. water and it was just amazing i feel like a lot of people have a very misconstrued idea of what Mexico actually looks like, you know, yeah. because I don't know if it's the picture that's painted by governments or what have you, or just news stories, well, tourist companies, you know, yeah, tourist companies. So I don't, you know, I, you hear, cause I have another buddy, Anthony, who uh, is a barber up here and he has spent a lot of time going back down to Mexico and he mm -hmm. says it's unbelievable, beautiful. He oh. loves living down there. So then you start hearing all these stories of people that actually do it and you go, something's not adding up because I'm told that it's not that great. <laughs> people are saying it's awesome. Well, I guess it depends where in Mexico. So Cozumel is an island. So first of all, there's no crime or very, very, very little crime. There's no major crimes because you can't go anywhere. It's like cheers. Everybody knows each other. Yeah, literally. So, you know, obviously there's the main strip, like the main avenue where all the touristy things are. And mm -hmm. then you go into like the the island itself and you know you have like your rotisserie chicken places and the taco places that you oh, pay like so 30 cents a taco <laughs> cents. Oh, dude, and it's probably, i don't know what the exchange rate now but i'm sure yeah, it's probably it's still, 60 yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> still, double damn. probably still pretty cheap 60 i mean bro i was living in a in a two-story flat and it was like 450 a month oh, rent man. it was out of control like sick like Huge, over a thousand square feet. That's dope. It was amazing. Like t five streets from the beach. That's awesome, man. Just get on your moped. Two minutes later, you're you're at the beach. Super cool that you guys experienced that. Yeah. So, what leads me to now? The next thing is now I I got offered to go to Alaska, which is where like all the biggest uh, ticket items go because the cruise ships only go there from May until September, and the cruise ships cost like the sh the cost per ticket is insane back They're then just still gen now i can't even imagine but like what's a popular is it alaska cruise so let's go in mid-july and let's go norwegian cruise lines norwegian that's right or or holland america you're probably going to pay close to five thousand dollars a cabin and that's for like the regular the basic, basic. yeah i had a customer they were paying like 30 grand a night for their cabin there's like cruise ships that have just outdoor cabins no like Fuck that, interior it's mad, mad cold <laughs> well it's not it's not that bad it it's rains bad. it rains it rains oh my god was it juno alaska is like the the main so hub? ketchikan skagway and juno are like it's called the inner passage oh yeah i'm looking right now glacier bay skagway and juno yeah from seattle washington seven day cruise it was 1075 and now it's six ninety nine. Well, now you're getting like a week, a night, or a that's week? That's for a... Per person. Oh, that'd be per person. Yeah, but that's for a sailing June to October. Okay. Listen, it is... It's pretty good. Yeah. I'm, well, where are we? We're in, we're in early June, I guess. Now is the season. Yeah, free at sea up to $3,400 off. So I guess that's why. <laughs> Probably no one's fucking traveling yeah, right well, now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no one's going to Alaska right now. Four seventy nine, bro. I might just have to fuck around. Yeah, yo, it's beautiful, dude. Yeah, it's so. If if I was gonna take a cruise, like to see like 
eagles and glaciers. Oh man, definitely. Like you feel like you're in another land. Like oh, actually, it's, just it's another dimension. Completely different world. It's so different. Like here, how we have pigeons. That's how there's eagles. There's eagles there's hanging out everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. Like I prefer you, the eagles over the over the uh, pit, the yeah. rats with wings. Like here, you go on a walk and there's deer. There you go on a walk and there's bear. Nah, <laughs> that's the one thing I'm not messing. I'm not messing with a bear. I'm not doing it. But it, it's it's definitely something else. So, so you it, got the offer to potentially yeah. go up to Alaska. So I went up to Alaska and then we were rebuilding this location, Ketchikan, that had been used. Like so, the company had 30 locations all over the Caribbean, St. Thomas, St. Martin, all over the Virgin Islands. And this is the and this is the, this the jewelry is the, company. The jewelry company that yeah. sells. Yeah, everything. Okay. High end watches, high end diamonds, t- everything. So they brought us to Ketchikan to like re blossom the location. So they gave us like insane pieces, brand new showcases. So we're like putting this all together and they were like grouping us as employee as salespeople, like with other people to like put showcases together or count jewelry or put displays together, whatever was needed to, you know, you're opening up a brand new jewelry store. And the person they grouped me with was this gentleman named Bay, who was from Senegal, Africa. But when he was young, he had moved to France, learned how to become a chef, and then became a chef down in the Virgin Islands because his cousin was the jeweler. So his cousin, who was like the sickest jeweler I've ever seen, man, this guy could mount a diamond in an hour, like nothing. You bring him in, like the people are like getting on the ship and you're making like a last minute sale and you're like, Abdu, I need you to mount this <laughs> now. And he's like, bro, I'm busy. I'm like, no, 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 no. They're Please on the, it. Please. Yeah. <laughs> and like two seconds, he's like, and this guy's fingers, bro, were completely torn apart from like, oh, I'm sure, you know, obviously doing the gold and. He didn't give a shit. Man. Tradesmen, any, anybody that is in a trade bro, like that, you just tell. Like dudes seen, that work in plumbing, dudes that work on construction sites, everyone's got very distinct hands. Okay, so now I'll tell you, my biggest sale in the company history was a 34 carat yellow diamond and 124 carat tanzanite. And so, for reference, give me a breakdown of what that would call what that cost. It would, the, the sale was eight hundred and seventy thousand dollars. Damn. Uh, and they're just coming off of a cruise. Yeah, someone just coming off a cruise, just yeah. spending eight hundred grand. Bro, this woman had like six carrots in each ear and like five carat stones in each. That amazes me. What bro, is the what is the lore money. to just buy expensive items? Could when you already just drop loot to? I mean, listen, take it take away from the fact that there are some people that just have stupid money and they just and the disposable income is exactly. Insane. It's like what my salary for a year is. <laughs> like there's like yeah, fuck around and just spend this and this and you're just whoa, man. But I don't know, you know, even like in my dad's situation, my dad was an iron worker. He didn't really, you know, have loot like that, but he bought a bomb mercy. I remember it being like at least three, two, two to three thousand dollars on a trip yeah. to the Bahamas. It's like, damn, man. If I could tell you, some people spend money like it. And was it, were these people like hard sales or did you? No, they, she was the easiest sale I've ever had. I showed, okay, so you have to understand this is a woman that has gigantic jewelry right it's blinged out so she's got she had six carat d flawless which was like the best characteristics you can have for color and clarity for a diamond six carats is obviously sounds gigantic. like the kind of woman that asks for a blood diamond she's like i need i don't want the, I don't want the blood free diamonds yeah i don't, I don't think diamonds. she gives a shit she don't give a I shit think, yeah i think she just wants size her earlobes are crying with yeah. having to keep that rock in there i bet i bet so, so you, say, so big, you see that yeah, you know you see that and you're like Big gaudy jewelry. You know, one thing that I would say separated me from a lot of the other salespeople is the fact that I come from New York, from Long Island. I, you know, I grew up around all kinds of people, people with money, people without money, people of different color. Melting race. melting pot exactly. of society. So it was easy to connect with people coming, random people coming off cruise ships. And so that first, you know, shell cracking that was easy was fairly easier for me than most people. And so big ticket items, I wasn't scared. I I would like literally just take them. We had a $11 million pink diamond. Okay. 11 million pink diamond. Yeah, it was. And now when, when a diamond is pink like that, is it naturally pink? Yeah. So it's naturally infused. No, no, no. Okay. Natural pink. Infused, you're paying like, I don't know if that, I don't even know. Like a couple of thousand dollars. You know, you can infuse color into anything. Okay. So you're talking like multi-million dollar piece, right? 
So now you're taking that and you're just putting it on someone's finger and you're like, hey, you're wearing, you know, 10 million, 11 million. You know, you don't give them that kind of price because they'll have a heart attack, but you're wearing a multi million dollar piece. Like, how does that feel? And, you know, they've, even though they have that kind of money, they've never experienced that kind of thing. Well, now you're like giving them an experience, right? Which is what it's all about for, you know, if that's why they're on the cruise. Now you're giving them like a memory for for, yeah. for life. And now they're going to be like much more open to spending big money with you, right? Because now you've cre- you've created a connection with this person. And you're also anchoring the price too. Yeah. It's like a sales tactic too. Correct. Anchoring high to have them think about that price and be like, whoa, okay. And, you know, you get it out of the way right then and there. And now they're thinking about what do I have to do to get this or what can I do to try to haggle and this and that. And now I at least know the price. Yeah. It's it's a it's a very interesting sales tactic of just throwing the number out there. It's the same thing with like services. Yeah. You know, someone says, you just go, well, this usually costs X. You know, what did you have in mind? And then, oh, well, that's the number that they're going to keep thinking about now. It's very interesting. Yeah, I mean, I feel like you're you're better off trying to start high and then work your way down. And then also, you know, you show someone something like that and then they can be like, "Oh, this guy's got some serious hardware I can work with." And I can tell you that I like I've sold this guy who was a landscaper out in California. I did the similar thing with him. He had this gigantic yin yang diamond ring. Oh yeah! And I'm like, this guy's got this guy's un- got it. Yeah. <laughs> so I pulled him. I pulled like a 15 carat stone out and showed him that. And then he's like, oh honey, honey, boom, boom, yeah. boom. Yeah. And I, dude, I got him for 300k. Damn. Like, this guy bought a five carat diamond, two two carat diamond earrings, a four carat diamond bracelet, like. You had him. You had him with the credit card scanner. You're like, and you're a, you do what? Yeah, yeah. landscaping. <laughs> yeah, landscaping. Yeah, landscaping. Got a lot more yeah. lawns to cut, brother. Yeah, <laughs> it's gonna yeah, be. Yeah. That's gonna be crazy. So, so anyway, so then because of that success, we, myself, and then a couple of other other of those salespeople, we got moved into this region in Mexico because the Alaska season is, is exactly that. It's a season. So in October. They take everyone out and they move them to the Caribbean for January to April. So you get like a month break in between. Oh, man. You just had the best of both. It was, it was really nice. So then I went to this area and we had a ton of success there. And this, this guy, Bay, ended up coming to live with me. And, he, bro, like the food that he would make was just out of control like i would be sleeping because we would work four days and then sleep uh rest for three days he would like take chickens and like break them down and make some stocks and sauces from scratch and like go fishing and bring back shrimp and, and there's the dude with the french background yes yes so i learned how to like really put food together fast forward multiple years now living with him like back and forth in Alaska and Mexico. I'm in Alaska and I dislocate my shoulder and I just completely wreck it. And how did that happen? Uh, went for a loose ball and someone dove on my arm and just completely detached out. It oh man. Fucking ter- it's still to this day is fucking wrecks. Anyway. So I started taking a ton of anti-inflammatories because I was working. I was in Alaska for work. So Did you like, have the sling? Oh, my God. It was so bad, yeah. bro. I c- couldn't even put my co- – like, I'd have to, like, put a collared shirt on. It was just miserable. And my bosses didn't care. Like, I'm one of the top salespeople. In, they in want the you out there, man. Yeah, they need me. You're out. only as good as your last sale. Exactly. As anything, you know. So, so I started, you know, pumping myself with ibuprofen and all these, th- you know, painkillers to help ease the pain but it ruined my stomach i couldn't eat anything i would eat fucking would come i would like be in a fucking huge sale and mid sale i'd run to the bathroom to go throw up because literally anything i now i was gonna say was it actually just throw up coming up or was it was it like the lining of your esophagus yeah so like a heartburn yeah so what it's called was is malabsorption so the gland in my stomach that produces acid wasn't producing the acid to burn the food so the 
So like some food was digesting and through my intestines. And it would just sit there like but, a rock but, yeah. in the food. And then it would wind up coming right back yeah, up. Correct. So that's it not, got that's not fun. No, it was that's not fun. <laughs> it got to the point where I started to you know, blood started to come up. And so I, that's where I was like, you know what? Yeah. No amount of money is worth it. And I like literally just left Alaska. I, I told my bosses and they weren't happy about that. I'm sure. And uh, so I went home and got all the testing. Which might I add though, real quick, it does course. suck that they didn't understand that because yeah. it's like, how many years did you work with them? And that you put 150% in. Dude. And just because like you're having some serious medical problems, they just don't they don't want to lose their yeah. guy from selling for them. But it's like, yo, I have to take care of me. Yeah, because I I mean I literally couldn't sell, dude. I was like in the bathroom multiple times a day. It was pretty brutal. And but that's where you know like, okay, so and then I started to like realize this is not going to be long term just because of the people, yeah, that I'm with, right? The environment. So I went back to Mexico. I did another season, and during that season was when everything changed. So uh, one of my best friends from high school, his sister was murdered, like, in cold blood um, while she was in school in Arizona. And so I was in Mexico and watching a movie, and I get a phone call, and I'm like, holy shit, you know, what do I do here? And, like, three days go by, and, like, no sleep just thinking about, you know, what, what I'm supposed to do. And so eventually I'm like, again, you know, this, at this point I'm like managing one of the, one of the super stores yeah. in, the, in the, in the company in Cozumel. And so I'm responsible for like 20 plus employees and, you know, $5 million plus of goods. So, you know, you don't just put in any manager for that. And uh, so I bounced, I came home. That was like the right thing for me to do. I couldn't call my friend to say sorry, you know? I had to see him and like hold him. And his dad had a very uh, like high-end jewelry store on Fifth Avenue that like clients like Michael Jordan, Allen Iverson, uh, the CEO of CVS Pharmacy, like big time yeah. clients. And, like, I come back after, like, four years of not living in New York or, like, just coming visit short and I haven't seen, like, all these people in so long. And it's, like, come into this house, like, to pay Shiva call. And, like, this is how you're seeing all these people that you grew up with and haven't seen in four years. And, like, it's, like, the most bittersweet experience. And then her dad's, like, oh, you know, I want you to get more. He's, he's like, I want you to come. Sorry. I, uh, yeah, you're whispering. Oh, I was yeah, like, yeah, I was looking at him like, I want to make sure your levels are good. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> he's whispering. But it, it's dark and ominous story. Yeah, it's okay. It's no, no, all no, about story. It's the broadcast. It's the broadcast. Side. <laughs> you're doing good. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so in short, he offers me a job to come work for him in the city. And then, like at that time, I already kind of knew that I wanted to start going to culinary school. Now, was it the reason you wanted to go to culinary school because of the guy that you yes. were rooming with in the Caribbean? Yes. And also, you know, I was having such digestive issues that I needed to learn how to eat, like how to, you know, and, and which leads me, I'll talk about it later, but like how to cut weight, you know, how to di help your food be more digestible. And uh, so through that process of going to culinary school and learning how protein breakdowns work and things of that nature... I started to, you know, test recipes at home. And at the time, that's when I started training martial arts also. Because when I'd come home, so I have a half sister and half brother who are 15 and 16 years younger than me. And so when I'd come home, I was in my early 20s, 24. So they were like 9, 10 years old. And so they were doing karate at a local karate school. And I would, you know, chaperone them around. And the guy that owned the karate school was like a super high level black belt from South Africa. This guy, Warren Levy, multiple time national, like Pan American champion. Cool. Um, and he's like, come train with me, come train with me. So I was like, all right, let me give it a yeah, try. Sure, so, why not? You know, why not? I have no, I had nothing. I was living already so far. I had dis disconnected from my friends for not completely disconnected but you know it's not the same when you're not spending that kind of time with them they all had, had gone to traditional colleges and done the traditional let's get fucked up in college and 
you know, figure out our lives afterwards. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I didn't, I had already done that, you know, figuring out like, okay, I'm going to be working towards that food, you know, thing. And uh, so while going to culinary school, I was working for my dad who had like a shipping store in uh, the five towns. And we would have the Food Network on all day long. And everyone would come in, oh, who watches the Food Network? And I would talk to the customers. And then it's a very religious area. So they also have food restrictions. And I started to, like, talk to people. And eventually I started, like, a small private cooking service. And I would, you know, do Shabbat dinners or small bar mitzvahs or parties that people paid me pretty nice money for you know i come in do two three hours worth of work and you're bringing all the food and everything and you're yeah. doing the prep work and everything there i don't have to like you know rent out a place and and it was working out you know i was training martial arts i was working for my dad a little bit i was going to school you know so i was you know dabbling in a little bit of everything and you this is karate not bjj yet. this is karate okay. this, this shortly after i started bjj okay because what was the reason that you switched from karate to BJJ? So I was walking across the street on a rainy day and some guy like ran over the curb, kind of like, you know, making a turn, yeah. hit the curb and almost hit me. So I like banged the car and was like, what the fuck? And so the guy came out of the car. Isn't that I'm, funny? He's the one who fucked yeah. up. Yeah. And you're the problem. <laughs> yeah. And you, bro, you almost hit me. Yeah. Like you almost killed me. Yeah. You and, almost killed uh, me. <laughs> How dare you tell yeah. me what I did wrong? Exactly. Get out of the he's car. Coming, no, he's like a small guy like you. You know, he's got a little complex. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> a complex. That's crazy. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to leave. Y'all can listen. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's, it's wet. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to fucking head kick the fuck out of this guy. Oh, shit. <laughs> But it's wet, so if, like, I slip, what's going to happen? Get your head backwards. Whatever. He's going to jump on top of me. Who the hell knows? Yeah. You know, we get into a little verbal argument. It ends. He goes on his way. I go my way. The second I get into the office, I start looking up Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. And, you know, like, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and watching videos and learning about. And literally, like... Four stores down from my dad's store was like a Gracie certified training center. Now I know how a lot of people perceive like the online Gracie jujitsu. I'm a white belt, so I don't I don't know any of these uh, I don't know any of these uh, rumors. So, I, I started at Sarah's and I'm just hanging there now. Nah, it's listen, yeah. <laughs> it's it's they're you know they're monetizing jujitsu as best as they can, which is fair play, you know. Um, but it was, and I will say like, they have a great, great foundation for understanding concepts of jujitsu. You know, you're going to learn basic concepts that are going to help you, you know, how to retain guard, how to mount somebody, how to maintain the mount. But it wasn't like I was learning the DVDs online. It was like at a school. Yeah, you were still you know? you're at an actual still, physical yeah, location. Exactly. So you're still like getting partner. You're still getting real work. Um, and then... It became where I was just, you know, beating up everybody. And then I, the karate place started a jiu-jitsu, like, MMA class, like a no-gi class. So I was like, all right, let me do that, too. Cool. So I started going there. And, but there was, like, taught by a purple belt, which was – at the time, look, you're talking 12, 13 years ago. Purple belt was, like, a big deal. Yeah. So it was, like, good technique, you know. But again, I started to like be more dominant there. And I was training this kid from Queens who was a professional fighter who happened to be training under Matt and Ray. Oh, sick. And he didn't really vibe with the crowd, I guess. At Matt and Ray spot? Yeah, I think he was a little bit... Um, his expectations weren't met. Which sometimes when we set expectations for things, we can get disappointed mm -hmm. when we think about how something's supposed to be. And it's like, oh, that's the reality is not so much. I thought I'd be a brown belt by now. Well, <laughs> you got a little, you are, you're a shitty belt. You are a shitty belt. <laughs> you're a shitty yeah. white belt. I thought, I, I thought I'd be a brown belt by now. Yeah. Yeah. That's the only shit. Is the, that's, that's, I'm trying to get a coral belt, but I just got to keep bleeding on the white belt and yeah, eventually well. it'll turn red. I can help you with that. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> <Anyway>. <laughs> so 
Yeah, so, you know, so this guy kind of, like, gave me, like, the motivation to kind of go train at math. Like, I'm like, how how bad could it be? You know, like, let me go see what this is about. So um, that intersected with me have opening up my gym in Belmore, which was very close to the Levittown uh, location. And so it was easy. Like I would coach classes in the morning and then I would go train in the afternoon class or I would do the morning class and then go work with my yeah, clients, like depending on my schedule for the morning. And, you know, I it was really nice because Sarah's had like a really nice openings for afternoons or morning classes or night classes. The night classes I didn't start to do till obviously the gym had been more of a function business. But, uh, you know, just working with with like all you know now is not as much unfortunate you know it's, it is what it is but you know back in the day you know we're talking five years ago before covid levittown was like you know mma you know all the guys were trained there aljo al matt vola weidman you know uh marab i mean every Tuesday night was like Jason Rao, Nick Ronan, uh, Anthony Powell. I mean, like endless big names uh, you know, that are just slim, dominant, dominant at what they do. Sell, it, it just guests, you know, Stipe Miocci. It, it just never ended. It was, you, you know, when you talk about humility, like you want to talk about hum- humility and humbling yourself you walk into sarah's on a tuesday night at levittown and you will be humbled guaranteed guaranteed and so like you learn right you know you you're gonna learn well I, listen man i started when i first started uh i saw no other white belt do what i did which was i was at every mixed class yes i was at every mixed That's class intentionally 100%. and then once i heard about the comp class not that I don't have an intention of competing. I'm just more nervous, though, about injuries yeah, in a competition. Because if a dude's going to go 110%, I have to match that energy. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, why am I here? Of course. So now if he's going to do 110, I got to go 110. He's not going to give a fuck about letting me tap. At certain. No. Most dudes are not going to. They're not going to be respectful about that shit. So it's like you have to just have that mindset. But even though I didn't have those you know, thoughts of doing that yet, Gary doing the Sunday competition class, I said, all right, let's go get thrown into the yeah. fire. Like, I know I'm going to get my ass kicked, but it is what it is. And it's funny because I see the drop-off rate from people that join the gym oh. to just, like, you don't see people anymore. And I look around sometimes and I go, where's everybody that I started with? Like, I see maybe three or four people that yeah. I started with. And I look around and I go, I've only been here for, a you know, a little over a year now, a year and a month. I'm like, what happens to people in that four-year, five-year span? They don't need... That, that life, went from bro. people that started five years ago is what I'm life. saying. Like they just life. I think, I think life is a lot of it, but I also think going back to humbling. Yeah. I think that is a big thing. Like, uh, another dude that I know, uh, shouts to Rishi. He's the homie. He said he used to train at Matt's for a long time doing jujitsu. And, uh, he said that place has a very, very f- funny, great way of weeding out people that don't belong in that sure. type of field. Yeah. And I think a lot of it has to do with the people that, don't want to admit that they got tapped or don't want to admit that I'm like, bro, I, I rolled with Anthony, Gary one night, Trotta, a couple of guys. Bro, I got tapped like 30 times, 40 oh. times in one night. And, I, and Anthony was probably 20 of them. Yeah. So, and, and I put that online. I went, I learned. Cool. Like, yeah. it is what it is. Like, am I, am I sore as shit? Without yeah. question. <laughs> Does my neck feel great? Yeah, they cracked me this way. At, at least somebody cranked me the other way and get me right back into alignment. Do something. But it's... I, I went into this understanding the mindset that I'm not the baddest dude. No. I'm not I'm not the baddest dude. As long dude. as you go to Sarah's, you never will be. No, I'm not the baddest dude. I'm not going to be. But listen, if I can give some people a run for their money and I can learn as I do it, great. And I think I've done a decent job at doing that so far. But like you said, it's a long journey. Yeah. And that's and I would say don't even think about giving people a run for their money. Think about just being able to survive against some of the most dangerous people. I think about uh, Robert Downey Jr. all the time in uh, Tropic Thunder. Survive. <laughs> Every time well, in the back of my head, when someone's choking me out, survive. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, come on, I'm Breathe. <laughs> I, I can't. He's choking me. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I, I agree without question. It, you it, know, those are the moments, though, Nick, that 
when you're being mounted or being choked and you have like you understand that you're actually safe, but it's just so uncomfortable. Oh, yeah. And you, when you can be like, OK, slow down, let me, you know, get an underhook, get a frame, whatever that. Needs. Yeah, try to try to almost get like uh, my feet my feet coiled up to try to do like a bridge or Whatever something. It is. You know, I try. There's a plenty of situations where I try, and I understand that. And I've said this to a lot of people that are thinking about joining. It's like the first time somebody takes your back and like puts their arm around your throat, that primal instinct of just going whoa whoa yeah, kicks in. For sure. But then after the third, fourth, tenth, twentieth, you're just kind of like, okay, let me see if I can work my way out of this, and you feel comfortable because you know. When God forbid you ever have to actually use the shit. Correct. Now you're just like, oh, okay, I've been here before like a thousand times. Okay, yeah. here we go. Butt to the floor. You're trying to figure things out. Yeah. I'm what I was just gonna say on top of like yeah. what I so I, I teach a small program in East Rockaway by me because I do live a little bit far from the academy. So, you know, I wanted my son to start training jujitsu and so I started a jujitsu program in one of the martial arts schools near my house. And one of my one of my guys, this guy Jason, I, I told him last night, you know, so proud of him because in the beginning he would like he, second he would be in a bad position, he would just tap so fast. And, you know, last night he was put into rear naked chokes, triangles, et cetera, because we've been working defenses. And you could see the confidence level in his ability to stay calm. Yeah. You know. That just just to be confident in yourself that you won't overreact in a situation is huge. You know, owning a gym for many years, I have I had people, you know, obviously come in after a full day and sometimes they're dehydrated or their blood sugar is low and now they're doing a, a hit circuit or lifting heavy weight, like deadlifting, and you know, they they black out or they pass out quick, you know? And you're like, Whoa, what the fuck? And you start to realize, like, it's just because their ability to manage stress was, like, so poor that when something, when the body started to... Getting overloaded. Overloaded. Stimuli or correct, stressors, issues. Immediately, yeah. it shut down. Yeah. Versus, like, I would, you know, you'd be like, okay, let's grab a cold compress, you know, stand him up, yeah. get his breathing regulated, stuff like that, where... I think that's what jujitsu teaches you is how to stay calm under certain situations like that. It's been a lot of times where, even with rolling with you, truthfully, uh, and when I, I rolled with Johnny twice last week, Johnny's a f savage. He's so good. Yeah, well, um, yeah. He embarrasses me and I'm twice the size. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's crazy. <laughs> uh, so I'm rolling with Johnny, and, and even when I roll with you, there are certain positions that I'll get into where he was doing, I don't know the, the choke name. I'm still trying to remember half the shit. But it's like when they grab underneath, not a bread cutter, but they baseball bat. Some, it, it might be a bread cutter then, where okay. he comes around the side like yes, that. Yes, that is a bread cutter. So he was doing he was doing a bread cutter to me, but he was doing it slow, like trying to just yeah. like he would just every time I'd buck a little bit, he would just like sink it a little slower. But even when I'm like sometimes I'll be on someone will be on top of me and they'll start going for the choke around the neck and your head's kind of out to the side, but you're losing your ability to breathe yeah. slowly. Having the the wherewithal to just go chill, like it's all good, because there are certain times where your breathing starts to become compromised, and you start to have that mm -hmm. that um that not anxiety attack, oh, but that, that that reaction, the fight or flight, yeah. yeah. Oh, and you just have to kind of just bring it mm -hmm. back down and talk yourself off the ledge, like yo, you're good. The second that you go, you're out of it. So just yeah. see what you could do, and the second it starts getting a little dark. Okay, yeah, we're good. For sure. <laughs> the second the lights start looking like didn't, someone didn't pay the bill. <laughs> you know, so speaking to that, you know, through your journey, you will there will be breaks, you know. So during COVID, obviously, I had to take a small break. So when I first came back to Sarah's, I was going up against uh, this guy, Pete, one of the purple belts. And he put me in a cross-collar choke. And I was, like, passing his guard. And I was, like, completely yeah. disrespecting the collar choke. Like I knew it was there. I just yeah. You're just like fuck it. it. I'm gonna just and all of a sudden I see like the lights start closing on me, and I'm like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> They're like, oh my god, it's you know, someone turn on the lights. Yeah, I'm like, oops, my bad. I'm like, that won't happen again. Yeah. So, but again, but that's the beauty of jujitsu. You learn to adapt in all kinds of different situations, and you know, going back to right. So having the gym, like COVID comes, and I had to shut everything down. Um, I had the option to maintain my facility and pay 
uh, the rent, which I was like, no thanks. Let me close up and then I can reassess the situation. Were they jacking your rent up at all? So it wasn't that he had jacked my rent up. The, so what happened was when COVID, so I have friends in uh, in places in the government, Homeland Security. That So when COVID started to happen, you know, communication with those people started to open up real, real fast. I'm sure. And uh, that's what I'd be doing. Well, you know, so, you know, through certain people, I found out that, hey, this is going to be like at least 90 days. Yeah. You know, don't expect anything less. It's not going to be two weeks to slow the spread. It's going to be a little while. Yeah. And uh, I was always caught, you know, I was always on time with my rent and I have a, I had a clause in my lease that allowed me to exit my lease as long as I was, you know, continuously paying and, it's called a good guy clause. Yep. I have that. I have that with my rent. I yeah. made, and I made sure, especially with after COVID and yeah. everything like that, I'm like, yeah, man, we got to have that in there. Absolutely. And then, of course, the landlord comes back. They're like, well, you know, if you give us three months of notice and this and that, I'm just like, hey, man, shit, shit gets yeah, crazy like that exactly. again. I'm packing everything up and I'm leaving. You'll never hear from me again, bro. Exactly. I'm like, I pay my shit on time, but like something like that, the world ending like in that, yeah. that way again, we're not doing that. Yeah, I'm not playing around. Yeah. So, so. <laughs> So I had, like, as soon as the government was like, all right, March 19th, gyms will be closed. So I called my landlord that day. I'm like, look, I'm just letting you know ahead of time, I will not allow myself to get into, like, some kind of three or four months back-ended rent where now I owe you $20,000 and I haven't had the ability to bring income in. And he's like, oh, don't worry about it. I won't do that to you. You know, we'll figure something out. Ba, 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 ba. And then now nothing against him as a human being. No. But lo, yo, dude, everyone's got to look out for themselves. Sometimes it, you will expect that money. Like, yeah. To be totally honest. Fact. You're not going to be like, hey, man, yo, you're just a good guy. Fuck yeah. it. Like, we're good. It's like, nah, you're not going to do that. You're going to expect that money at yeah. some point. So so right off the bat, and this is where, again, going back to communication being super important. This is something I learned from my coach. Like, communication is everything. And, uh, yeah, I was consistently throughout the, the, whatever they call it, the pause, um, communicating with him that like, Hey, here's the situation. Like I will, you know, I don't want to be paying you X, Y, and Z. And again, he's like, don't worry about it. We'll make whatever necessary arrangements. And then June, when everything started to open up again Mm -hmm. and gyms were supposed to be in like phase four. And then, like, nothing. Yeah. And they were like, everything's open except gyms. Yeah, interesting. The next day, he calls me. He's like, well, what do you want to do? Because this is not, you know. He's like, if you want, I'll, you could pay me the back last next four months. Yes. <laughs> and I'm like, no. no. <laughs> I'm like, I'll get my stuff out by the end of the week. Yeah, don't worry about it. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a fit young yeah, lad. Yeah, exactly. I was like, I called a bunch of my clients. They got a fucking truck for Home Depot yeah. and I put everything in my garage and yeah. now I coach all these clients out of my garage. Oh, you still do? Yeah. Oh, that's absolutely. cool. Yeah, so... So like being at Sarah's... Not to jump, not to, no, not no, to no. jump skip, but I, no, I was like, so oh, like so you being, still do. That's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Because... You I don't know, know if you got, maybe got a new location. That's why I said Yeah. That. So, you know, I think that's going to be coming in the near future because of now things are really starting to blue, bloom nicely. I love um, that. Uh, with, you know, I, one thing that when I had my gym, I was always helping people with recipes, obviously, from my culinary background and how to bring, and not just my culinary background, but my, my issues with digestion, you know, like, and over time, like, I understood, like, hey, there's certain underlining things that most people are dealing with that you can, you know, triage um, with certain things. And you're going to get a huge, you know, small hinges, swing big doors kind of effect. And so when I started to do that, you know, you get a good buy-in, right? Like, it's like you tell someone, hey, you know, start taking fish oil more regularly because it's going to help or you know something that maybe most people don't use is black cumin seed oil right so black cumin seed oil super high anti-inflammatory antiviral antibacterial super super uh effective for performance does it have to be the cold pressed one uh no i use an oil that's not i don't think it's cold pressed but um 
about a tablespoon. Like you give somebody a small dosage. One, one a day? One tablespoon a day, or uh, you could take it in a capsule. It depends on, the obviously, the size of the capsule. And you get a huge, huge benefit from that, and people start to see immediate relief. You know, like someone who does jujitsu, you give them something like that, they're going to immediately feel the relief in their joints, right? Cause That's you what get, I need, truthfully. Yeah. My elbows, they make so much noise since I started. Yeah, so like something like black human seed is, is money for that, you know. Obviously, you, you have your like, you know, creatine, protein powders, fish oils. Curcumin. You know, curcumin, glutamine, like stuff like that that are based on you know necessity like if you take head injury i I think everyone should be taking creatine but i guess dosage would be based off of like if you you know play sport or take hand in head shots you know because i work with some ufc fighters so you know work being at sarah's you create relationships like this yeah and uh you know one of the fighters charlie campbell who i've been working with now for a little bit over two and a half years you know he's a lightweight in the ufc that Starting with him immediately, like giving him the black seed oil, he felt, you know, some drills that I had learned. So my strength and conditioning coach, his name's Will Chung, and he comes from, so his grandfather is Huang Ki, so, and he started a uh, mar- martial art called Tang Sudo. Mudo, Tang Sudo. Yeah, Mudo Kwan. So, uh, you know, Chuck Norris is a black belt in Mudo Kwan. Oh, sick. So, so give you like a frame of... Where it's a Korean martial art, and his background with that, and then learning, uh, he was one of Pavel Tatsuin's first kettlebell students, and taking, you know, principles from his grandfather and Pavel, and like integrating that into strength training for longevity. That's sake. so cool. Pavel, Pavel is dope, man. Yeah. So I mean, that dude's a brick wall. I feel like just, oh my god. Just swing and swing. He was on Rogan. He was talking about everything that he did. He was like super serious. He's yeah. great. Well, Pavel's very serious. Yeah. But, and, but that's where I think, you know, um, certain people vibe with certain, with some with others and not, you know, and that's where, so like, obviously, um, I think I, I generally am doing it out of the good, out of my heart. Like, you know, you have people, especially like, you know, there's Sarah, you got, UFC champions, right? So you're going to have people, oh, let me take a picture with you. Let me. And then there's a ton of strength and conditioning coaches at Sarah's, and they're all really good. Sorry. And they're all really good. And it's like, oh, let me help you with this because you're going to see gaps in these fighters' training because they're just fighters. They're not, they didn't go to school to understand nutrition or, mm-hmm. or strength. And some of them did, but most of them didn't. Most, most, of them, most of them were athletes and they got told what to do. Correct. The corresponding coach. Correct. And so there's gaps in areas. So it's like you see a gap in a fighter area and you're like, hey, look, you know, I genuinely would love to help you. Forget about the fucking money. Like you're a professional fighter. Like this is, and I think, and this is where, what's helped me um, with working with NFL athletes, working with UFC fighters is understanding that they're just people like they are putting their lives on the line for a paycheck there's no guarantee of a paycheck and that sits on the back of their mind just like if you or me didn't have our rent lined up and i think people you know most general sports fans or people in general look at athletes and like, oh, wow, he's living his dream. I mean, but there's a price that comes with that dream when you have so many people put you on a pedestal. So, like, I know, obviously, uh, a lot more UFC fighters just training at Sarah's throughout the years, and I do NFL players that I've worked with. But I can tell you they're very similar in the, in a sense of like, hey, it's hard to trust people. And those circles are usually generally very small. So when you can earn their trust and build their confidence in some, so like working with Charlie, he was having some issues that I gave him like one or two things that gave him such a big bang for his buck that he was like, oh, this guy knows 
what he's talking about. And then he was working with another string coach at the time. And I could see, like, there was some gaps in what they were doing. And not because what the guy was doing was wrong. Because he was doing, you know, zercher squats, which is very common in a strength in wrestling or Mm -hmm. jiu-jitsu. But the load that you're putting on a fighter who trains wrestling and jujitsu and fighting. You're striking, yeah. Like, and strike, yeah. Mm-hmm. I know what you meant. Yeah. yeah. You're, but also, like, then mixing the, all those things together in session. So he's doing his wrestling. He's doing his jujitsu. He's doing his striking. And then he's also doing MMA sparring. And now you're, like, loading him up with heavy loads. The ability to recover, you're not helping him on the nutrition side. So the ability to recover is so minimal that he's getting almost nothing out of those next two days of training. So that's where I was able to just relate to someone like Charlie who, you know, I trained jujitsu and I, you know, now I'm in my forties, but when I was in my thirties, I was, you know, powerlifting in my gym and then going to jujitsu in the, like I would do my workout and then immediately go to jujitsu. And then, you know, some of the guys would make fun of me because I'd, you know, deadlifting heavy weights and then they're like oh shit are you gonna deadlift me next i'm like no like i'm here to the point of training first the weights is so that way when i come in you're not using I'll, your strength and you're pretty fatigued correct that's what jocko talked about when i when i first started jujitsu and he said that he, that's what he likes to do so this way he's not using muscle to get a lot of the moves and this and that i said oh that makes a lot of fucking sense yeah. I mean, and again, me being, I am a bigger guy, you know. I know, you've laid across my chest. <laughs> so, I know he's a bigger guy. So, you know, you want to, you want to, you know, you want to be technical, you know. you yeah. want, Obviously, you're going to use your power just like a small guy's going to use I have to, I have to lean into it sometimes. Yeah, my grip, My grip strength and yeah, just my absolutely. ability to leverage certain areas. It's like, I, I, you know, there's plenty of times where I've had somebody's head and it started as a choke, but now they've either worked their way around. It's like, all right, I can keep sitting here and crank them, or I can just like try to figure something else out. I usually just let go. I just go, here you go. All right, yeah. Let's just do something else because I'm not going to sit here and just keep ranking on your neck for no fucking reason. If I'm not going to get a move, it's not actually yeah. a move. So, yeah. So, yeah. So, like that ability to just take, you know, I guess small, um, I don't want to say like take what's given, but like take small uh, pieces of yourself and, you know, not overloading somebody and giving them like really good quality, whether it's a supplement a protocol or a training protocol that they can easily follow and you're not like overbearing. It's, you know, so we have a drill that's uh, called the seesaw drill where you're just in a squat position. You're alternating your heels. And it, so like you're alternating your heels out. So you're in a squat position. Your toes yep. are 45 degrees and you're okay. pumping your heels up and down. Oh, just like this. Yes. Like, a, okay. Gotcha. But you're in a, you're in a squat. Oh, that's interesting. And it burns. It's like a dorsiflexion reverse. Correct. That's cool. But what it does is it pumps the hell out of your ass and your quads really so someone with a lot of knee or lower back pain you can get them to stable like you know it's a horse stance that you're pumping Mm -hmm. and you're getting a ton of blood flow into that area so someone that has a knee injury for example you get them something to do (laughs) like this guy's gonna so so what what you're gonna do is we're gonna set up in a w footing how we do w is we're gonna go v heels together 45, now A, heels out 45, and then toes out 45. And that's going to show you how to get get into a perfect squat every time, right? That's cool. So now, slight, no, just a little higher because you're going to blow your legs up from there. And now alternating heels like you're passing air through a balloon. But like, so as one comes up, so you're passing air on a balloon. Yes. Yeah, I feel it. Oh, yeah, you feel it. <laughs> I don't want to sweat. <laughs> I'm starting to sweat. Yeah. So that, that, that's, that's a good one. Like, you get people. All right, Evan, I know you're, gonna, I know you're watching this. Evan owns OG Training, the, the hit classes that I go to in the morning. 
if I see the seesaw squats, I, I'm sending I'm sending them in for the fucking residual to check. I'm like, I send my man a check. No, that's that's the Will Chung. That's a Will Chung. That's piece. awesome. That's that's from my coach. But that's where it's like again learning things along the way. Whether it's the food that I learned to cook in culinary school to the issues that I had with my stomach and how to adapt. Well, it's about bridging everything that you're, all the knowledge base. I mean, that's what you're supposed to do in life. Theoretically, that's really what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to take all of our experiences that we've learned, all the networking, everything that we experience and do on a daily basis and bridge it all together and be one thing. That's what I used to do when I, uh, when I was selling uh, at Best Buy a long time ago. There were guys that sold the upper tier home theater systems. Mm-hmm. There were guys that sold the regular ones. And there were guys that just were shitty salesmen. So I knew not to hang out with the shitty salesmen. <laughs> but I would take the upper tier guys. Everyone sold differently. So I would literally just go hang out with one guy. Then I'd hang out with another. Then I, and, yeah, and, and, I, and I would just take everything that they do that works. And I would adapt it to the way that I sold. And yeah, it just sure. worked. Yeah. So I got the best of everything. But you also, again, you're putting your, your own personal... Yeah, you're putting your own flair on it, your little yeah, spin. Your own personal, your personality, you know? And that's where... I don't have one of those. Yeah, no, you have a great person. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. But, you know, and that's, I think, um, you know, obviously, we all think it's going to take a lot less time than it does. It takes time. But I think that's the beauty of life is, like, going through, I think, going through those things, you know, having the gut issues... And sometimes it, you know, flares back up. It's like a reminder of like, hey, you know, there's a purpose to what you have to do, not just for, you know, financial benefit or to help, you know, this person or that person, but how can you elevate yourself through that experience of working, you know, with, you know, NFL all-star or, uh, elite UFC fighter or you know one of my I would say my best uh learning example would be my client Allison who's my longest running client and six years ago she had a stroke and like lost all function and you know I'll take a concept that my coach shares with me and I'll share it here uh, and how I was able to help her so our body, if you think about it, works like a kingdom. Our organs are inside the ca- like our heart, our liver. Like those things go down, your castle has been taken over, and you're probably going to lose your kingdom. So we always, our brain, our natural human function is to protect those things on a daily basis: drinking water, eating, sleeping, etc. Then our limbs and things of that nature would be like the people that live right outside the kingdom, like right outside those castle walls, if they get in trouble or get hurt, that can compromise the safety of the kingdom. So as long as you're taking care of everyone in the kingdom, everyone outside the kingdom, and even the people all the way, the furthest into the woods, your tippy toes, because when we go into frostbite, first thing, we lose our tips of our fingers so someone like allison i had to like just get her to connect to yeah, her the finger. dexterity back again just to like get blood flow in there by pressing or having her hold and learning and understanding like hey you got to work in to out sometimes not just out to in yeah you know which is a lot of times how you know pressing heavy weight sprinting really hard that's out to in and that's where my coach will like he's his comes from a very long line of martial arts but also practices internal martial arts so he you know uh uses the revolving door method like if you can turn inside you're going to turn outside so like whether you're striking or trying to rotate someone and sweep someone if you can do that from the center of your your abdominal wall you're going to have your your legs are going to rotate much stronger much 
more rapidly. Because everything's connected anyway. Correct. That's why it's almost like flattening somebody out. You take a lot of their, their force and their will again, away from them. Yeah, or just breaking someone's posture, right? Like yeah. just holding the back of the head. You're able yeah, to- I do that all the time when I'm in a weird position and I'm just like, okay, back of the head time. <laughs> you know how many leg locks I've gotten out of? I'm, <laughs> grabbing, I'm grabbing the back of someone's head. I'm yeah. like, all right, so we could either sit here all fucking day or you could let go of that leg. And <laughs> well, <laughs> that, that person needs to work their leg lock oh, finishes. Oh, shit. No, 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 it's, it's it, because here's the thing that is a, a defense, I guess, but yeah. it's not a substantial defense. I know I'm Almost. supposed to, I'm supposed to strip the legs yes. and, and o- open up, but it's okay. sometimes it's not there. <laughs> it's not there. But hey. that, that neck is. Hence, <laughs> hence the shitty white belt. <laughs> That's crazy. You got to look for it. You got to be patient. You got to breathe. You got to relax. It's there. Ryan, there's a lot. It's a lot going on right now. A lot going on. A lot going on. on. Listen, that's where like leg locks, being at Sarah's, you have a whole different appreciation for leg locks because a lot of gyms don't focus on leg locks like we do. You're a 10th planet guy. They do. Yeah. But even then, like, you know, you got to understand the lineage we have here, whether it's Anthony teaching now, but before Anthony, it was Jason and... And Jason, obviously, coming off of not just being a black belt under Matt, but also training under the Danaher uh, death like squad group. A death squad. That yeah, he I mean, in. Jason, I would say, was probably one of the staples in that group, along with Gordon and Gary Tonin and, and Eddie Cummings. You know, as long as I've been going to Sarah's, Jason's been going to uh, Don. Well, not now, obviously, because yeah. he owns his own academy. I know Gary is telling me he used to train there too. Yeah, Gary also. Yeah, yeah. like. So the you're not going to see, even at a 10th Planet place, you won't see. They don't, you know, I'm not trying to say that 10th Planet doesn't have great technique, but. I'll say, you know, start some beef right here. Well, it's not. I mean, <laughs> I think the beef has been going on for years. I don't think I'm starting anything. <laughs> yeah, I just think shit. that, I'll be, I mean, look, th- there's a whole curriculum that goes behind the Donaher system. So the fact that, you know, we get that, we got that second hand through Jason, I think is a very rare thing. And now, obviously, you get it from Anthony and, uh, you know, Manny and, you know. Manny's coming, on, Manny's coming on next week. Yeah, so, that, you know, like, there's so many good, so many good people. I rolled with Manny before. It's Bro. It's so controlled it's and relaxed. He's, like, just hanging out. Just him having fun. I just feel like he's just chilling. <laughs> yeah. You know, I used, uh, I used to think, like, you had to, you know, just try to be better. Yeah. But it's not trying to just be better. Like, finding ways to... You know, putting yourself in bad situations, but sometimes that becomes not fun. Yeah. So, someone, uh, this guy Mike Fowler, who was here. Yeah. So he talked about you know not being a mouse that tries to like hunt the cat, uh, not being a cat that tries to hunt the mouse, but more the cat that's having fun with the mouse. Mm-hmm. Yeah, luring it in. Correct. And I've done. I've done that a few times now. Yeah. So you're gonna have. Let's take something by the way. No, no, no. It's no big deal. Just if I, I every now and then, like I'll, I'll give somebody the opportunity to mount and I'll do that one where you send them right yeah, back oh, to the same side that they went. I love that. Oh, it's so love good. And I've so done, good. I've done the, I've done the flower sweep a few times. Nice. Yeah. I try, but I, but I'm always like, they'll put a leg up and I go, oh shit, it's the wrong side. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do that side. <laughs> no, but you know, and that's, I get, you know, again, being a white belt, that's going to, it's like, hey, okay, you got to learn how to. I asked Eric how to do something on an opposite side, and he just goes, Nick, I'm a brown belt on one side. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, fuck, okay. Yeah, so there you have that, too. Yeah. I think, look, I don't, I, I used to think, like, oh, you have to drill both sides, but that's not the reality of life in general. You know, as a strength coach, people are always like, oh, I need to work both sides. No, you don't, because you don't wipe your ass with both hands never you don't eat with both hands you don't drive with both hands you don't do a lot of things with both hands and actually the majority of the things you're doing you're not doing with both hands and especially when it comes to sports so if you're a good baseball player you throw with one hand dominantly you're not like a multi you're not throwing the ball with both hands so the same thing with basketball like yeah i do throw righty and i hit lefty well, that's that's okay. I can, I can hit righty, but it's not it's not excellent. It's not the same. Not but, excellent. And I'm not saying you can't build it up. So, um, I have a friend who is a striking coach at uh, Black House out in California, and he trains under Dan Inosanto, who is very into Filipino is the the guru of Filipino martial arts, right? So Jason um, helps teaches me some Kali. So 
What is that? Kali is uh, like stick fighting. Oh, okay. Cool. Um, Filipino martial art. So you learn like, holy shit, I have so much more dexterity with one side over the other. Oh, yeah. Now you're going to build, obviously, the dexterity on both sides, and it's going to help you in sport, but you're still always going to fall back to your strength side, your right hand, your whatever it is. So I feel when I do the clubs. The right side feels great. The left side's kind of wonky. Exactly. But if you worked the left side for a long time, it would feel a little bit better. And over time, it may come to a more neutral place. But if you did the same work with the right, it's going to... The right's always just going to be... Immediately go to a much higher place than the left is just because your brain functions better on that side yeah and you know you have to understand that i'm trying to play into it <laughs> good hey man you want hey you want to work good on that side let's just keep it on there <laughs> but that's where it's like don't think that you know you're a white belt on one side and a brown belt on the other you're you know whatever right, right. eric I'm not you're a white belt on both sides, both, both sides. <laughs> i mean let's say for myself i'm a brown belt you know and i don't even look at my belt like at, at this point if even if I got a black belt, it doesn't matter. You know, there there comes a point where you're gonna get to, and you're just gonna be like, all right, this is my schedule. This is when I get here. You know, I have two kids, so like, I have clients out here out east. Then that those are the days that I'm going to Sarah's. Like, yeah. I'm not. I live out in Hewlett. So, you're not going tonight, right? Uh, what's tonight? Six thirty. You're going to tonight's class. What's today? Friday. Friday? No. No way. I don't know. I figured no, maybe I you're already up no, here. Or you had Friday, your mom pick up the kids. That's what I'm saying. Like Friday is like, hey, you know, family night. You that's know? good. So, that's good. So that's where it's like, okay, but tomorrow morning I have a client at 8:30, and I'll coach that client, and then I'll he's in plain view, and I'll just pop over to Sarah's, and I'll get to Sarah's at nine, like right away. Cool. You know, so it's like, yeah, you gotta you gotta be able to adapt and just work it in when you can. And you know, like my wife is the best because she's cool with me hanging out and doing the training, and obviously. It also has a, probably an understanding that this is your industry and what you're involved yeah, with. And it, yeah. Not, I, only, not only does the training help you physically, mentally, everything like that, but it also is potential networking connections that you make over time. Yes, for sure. I think, but like you said, the networking connections, but like for me, because I teach also, so it's like, hey, look, it's I'm reinvesting it into myself. You know, I'm not going to just teach and not continue to learn. Yeah. In, in my, and it's the same thing in my field. Like I'm a strength and conditioning coach, but- I have a strength and conditioning coach that's just way fucking smarter than I am. And I know that he's constantly, constantly growing and improving himself and digging into realms that like I would never dig deep into. And that's, I think, you know, I think that's what the beauty of this podcast is or like what you're doing is like, you have so many different people coming in here and giving you their input. And that's where like, why I, I, you know, I said, Hey, you know, I'd love to come. Cause Hey, I had, a, I had a podcast and I had like Jim Miller, UFC fighter, or like this guy, Rich Sadiv, world-class strength coach. This guy's a multiple world time deadlift record. That's sick. Like this guy's 185 pounds, 700 pound deadlift. Okay. 50 years old. Okay. Just to give you an idea, like world record holder. And it's like, you've, you, it's hard. It's hard to like bring in people that are interesting and you know that you can connect with because it's not just are they you know what do they have to offer? What can they do for me? You know what I mean? It's there has to be some kind of like actual connection. And uh, I just like hanging out with people. I just like hanging out, talking, hearing about life, things people have gone through. Yeah, because it's just everyone's gone through a lot of similar experiences, but a lot of d- very different experiences. Yeah. So it's like we can. We can uh, co-synergize on certain things that we both have gone through, you know, like being a white belt. You were a white belt at one point. I was a white belt now. (laughs) So, you know, things that we have gone through, we understand one another on. But like living in Alaska, living in the Caribbean, doing all these different things, forming your business, having to break down your business because of COVID. Like that was me for a little while. So like up until that point, now we're back to that synergy of like understanding each other. And then obviously we go into different, different realms of experiences again. It's, it's just a cool, it's a cool way to do that. And there's a lot of people that start these things, which you've seen, they start podcasts, they do things and you know, you could, 
you know? I mean, listen, and that's okay. You could, you could, like you said, you could bring in very interesting people, and if the synergy isn't there as a person, it, you know, the, it doesn't resonate with yeah, the audience. Yeah, the, sure. the people don't want to listen or they don't right. care, and they, it just is what it is. I mean, listen, I always use Joe Rogan as a, as, a, as an example because that's the Podfather. <laughs> that's the that's the man. So he's had people come on that just didn't work. Yeah, that's okay. It's just an episode. It's an episode, and maybe they maybe those people come back on years later when maybe they just were uncomfortable and they just didn't want to talk much or what have you. Maybe it was Joe. Maybe he just didn't fuck with them. Whatever it is, mm -hmm. like maybe they come back on or maybe they don't. But maybe the next episode was a banger, and like they had. I go into this with like very neutral expectations. You know, I want to hear about people's lives, the backgrounds, just hang out because the things that you've gone through. Not only can that maybe help somebody that's listening and shape their experiences with something that they're going through, but maybe they utilize your services too. Maybe they say, oh shit, I, I need help with exactly what you were just talking about or programming or nutrition or this and that. Like, It's just a way to bridge the networks and get everybody closer as yeah. well. That's what I always try to do. I always try to put people in touch with one another. I'll give you an easy example. My boy Tom, who I was at yeah. his gym earlier today, mm -hmm. the, the Julie. Yeah. Was at Tom Spot today. We were doing some content filming for uh, All Black Everything, and uh, while he was letting another supplement company know that he's not working with them anymore and he's working with All Black Everything, that guy just so happened to be leaving the company at the same time. Just happened to be leaving the same company at the same time, and the All Black Everything may be in need of that guy. Mm. So I said, all right, let's put it all together. Here, here's his resume. Like, let's try to just synergi synergistically get everybody in tune. And yeah. If it works, great. It if it doesn't, everybody. no worries. We tried. Yeah. I like bridging the gap of networks with people. If somebody, I'm the guy, I'm the guy that I hear somebody has, has a, a, a fucked up hamstring or a bat. I got a guy. Let me, let me get you in touch. So you're not in pain anymore. Let me get you in touch with my guy. See if he could help you out or, oh, you need a body work. You need body work done. I got my guy. Like yes. I'm the guy that's got the guys. And I want to always help people yeah. out with my network. And it's not that I intentionally build my network. It just unfolds because I like people. Yeah. It's personality. Yeah. And you know, and there's like, plenty of people I don't fuck with that I don't ever want to see again. Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> oh, your back hurts? Ah, oh, that sucks. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I ain't giving you my guy. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, you know, again, it, it is personality. And I think that that's how you're going to, you know, evolve yourself by consuming all these stories and you know, seeing how you can vibe yourself in that direction and how it can work for you or not, you know. Or yeah, like, listen, like, you Yo. take it every single day, every single episode. You take it with strides, a grain of salt. You have fun doing it. Uh, you know, I did a live podcast at High Rocks. Oh, cool. Uh, last Saturday. And you know, oh, I, didn't, yeah, that's right. I didn't know how it was going to turn out because I used my old, this is my new board that I use for all my audio stuff, but I have my old board that I used to, which is still, it's an $1,100 board. Mm -hmm. I have my old board that was more so for videography, photography, yeah. uh, videography and cinematography where right. like actual audio guys will have the boom mic and mm -hmm. they'll just monitor the audio through that. I was using that for a podcast. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> just cause I love the, 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 the clarity of the tube amps that it had in it and all the different features. So I said, fuck it. Let me bring that with one camera. Yeah. And I didn't want to bring these mics because these are too sensitive. Mm. So I bought two Shure mics, which are micro yeah, microphones. Yeah, I saw those that you have over there. Bro, it turned out great. Yeah. Like, it, 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 everyone said they absolutely loved the raw, hanging out, chilling, in the moment podcast. And I said, all right, I got to do more of those. Yeah. I got to go to events, maybe jujitsu tournaments, say, stuff like I was that. Just, just hang say, out. That's honestly, and also because you're getting raw emotion yeah from like hey you know when you're in an event your senses are way more heightened so like now you're getting interviewed you're you're going to give better answers yeah. you're going to be more enthusiastic about those answers as as the interviewer you're going to get better you know better content and it's funny listen like just, these are raw i don't edit these the, out of out of i've done this is going to be 101st episode 101 oh, nice. cool so out of 101 episodes on this and then i had 11 episodes with my boy tyler and i had an additional 70 episodes with my boy john originally with our first podcast that we did together you know i've only had to maybe edit two podcasts three podcasts because somebody just said some shit that i was like <laughs> dude i can't have that out yeah. there that is crazy i was like thinking to myself i'm like this motherfucker better fucking edit whatever i need him to edit nope. okay, I'm, I'm just kidding nope. it's wrong I'm it's wrong it's going out there I, I'm, I'm not worried if about it jumping on my table and <laughs> crazy shit i'll be like okay that's getting edited <laughs>
<laughs> All right, now I know how to edit it you know out how. immediately. You say something, you fuck up, and you go. Yeah, just just blow an ass yeah. into the fucking microphone. <laughs> oh, no, I'm keeping that. I'm keeping it farting. <laughs> so yeah, so it's I've always I. Personally, that's why I've always resonated more with podcasts that are more raw, that are more just sure. the cameras cut on. That's why we just started talking. Yeah, the cameras that's cut on the boards. The you know what I'm saying like the boards yeah. going for the audio, and we just have a conversation, and it just flows into it. Versus like, hey guys, this is Nick, and welcome back to Resology. Yeah. Oh like, my I god, bro! I don't want to do that. I want I to hear just you. be like they're hanging out at the end of the table, and we're just hanging out right here. So, and I think this honestly, the like. So back to my experience of like trying to do a podcast, that's where I failed is I, I didn't have the, I think the connection, obviously, again, going back to the connection of like being able to have a conversation with someone when you're trying to like worry if the audio is working I mean, in on the phone because call. Every now and then you know, I look like, down here, I check your camera, I check the, the wide camera and I check my camera to make sure everything's still recording, make sure that the levels are good. Yeah, but that's also like. That's the thing is you even though you're doing that, it's still because there's almost because there is so much around, it's like you just tune it out. Yeah. Versus like one camera or or the sorry. Don't, or, don't apologize. Okay. Beat or, the shit out of that mic. Or the <laughs> or the board being like directly in front of you and like you looking at all it's just like, okay, let me just take a look. Well, I've had plenty I've had plenty episodes where I, I'll be talking for like twenty minutes, thirty minutes, and I'll look and the camera their camera is not recording, and I'll be like, Great. <laughs> Great. You gotta get up. You, you gotta go. Me monologuing. You oh, dude, me. it's so it's so bad. It's like, and we're back. Like, <laughs> <laughs> no, well, that's why you have a fail safe of a wide camera. Yeah, you smart. know, I've just I've learned to build these different things. But my last studio was way smaller, so I wasn't able to have this much freedom and space in there. So that that was part of like the learning process of like this one. Now it's like, wow, okay, now I can actually have everything cohesively in like a nice area. Yeah, but and and you know, and not only just it looks better here, but on the outside looking in the production level is much higher because you have and you know i think again integrating your videography you know yeah. even though this is a podcast and you're a podcaster it's like no you're you have excellent have video, have video excellent background. videography skills Thank and you. so you understand like you know i went to broadcasting school so you understand like okay wide shot you need a headshot you need a, yeah. a shot from here you know you need lighting to make sure my big ass forehead isn't fucking we have the lighting yeah i should i got I'm sure I'm shining like a fucking. Nah, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> it's all good, but but that's what I'm saying. Like those things that that you did that you're bringing in from your other experiences makes this experience more potent, and so then this now becomes a greater piece of content for you to be able to use in other avenues, and is going to draw other people in. Mm -hmm. And over time, like hey, and then. The next Joe Rogan, like hey, you never know, man. And I, I have to, I try to, I try to just set the expectation that this is going to be something great at one at at one point in time. Yeah. You know, I'm on episode 101. That's awesome. You know, I've got 2,700 episodes to catch up to Joe. Like, oh. you know, because I use him as the truth be told, I use him as the yeah, benchmark. Absolutely. Not just because of like who he is as a person, but I mean monetarily, the caliber of guests that he come has come on and the. It's so crazy because I was talking to my mom about all this. I told you before we started contract shift, different clients in and out and whatnot. And I'm coming to the realization on one front that I have to continue building my personal brand. That's really what I have to do. You know, even with my Instagram stuff for the longest time, I only I only put up things that like I did with clients here and there. I didn't really just take photos to take photos or mm -hmm. take videos to take videos or if I wanted to if I wanted to do a, a piece on one of the guys at Sarah's and just say, yo, just Give me like a little biopic or yeah. something like that. I, I just I didn't do it because I wasn't getting paid mm. to do it. Yeah. And when I first started all of that yeah. side of things, it was really with the intention of this. I mm. bought a camera because I wanted to vlog. I bought a camera because I wanted to do day in the life videos and become a YouTuber and not necessarily like a jerk off YouTuber. Yeah. That's like stroking their ego. Share, I wanted to share my people, my experiences, because just as I'm in Sarah's now with the UFC guys and all mm -hmm. the MMA fighters and the jujitsu artists and practitioners and whatnot. Just as I'm in there, my background was bodybuilding for the longest time. I mean, I was with Flex Lewis, Kai Green, Sergio Oliva Jr., like all of these huge fucking names in the industry that outside of that industry, people just think they're jack dudes. But mm -hmm. if you're in that industry, you know that's, oh, that's a dude that I have to wait two and a half hours in line yeah. to shake their hand for Absolutely. four seconds. So I wanted to showcase my experiences with them and this and that. 
But then it turned into, hey, can you shoot this promo video? Hey, can you do that? Hey, can you do this? And I was like, okay. And so that business blossomed while my personal brand fell to the yeah. wayside because you're getting paid. You're like, okay, keep going that. Absolutely. So now, say all that to say, I'm back on the grind of we have to shoot things and do things because we're going to grow ourselves now and we're going to grow our page and our channel where – I don't know if you know the Buttery Bros. Do you know the Buttery Bros? Yeah. So they came on my podcast. Uh, I'm very good friends with Heber, Marston. Jules is their graphic designer and fucking awesome guys. They're really great. Something that they said to me, which stood out to me in our conversation was, they said we were shooting for CrossFit Games. We were shooting for all these companies. And it's like, we just felt unfulfilled. And in certain ways, I definitely understand that because they kept just project to project. And then when there's not a project, there's no project. But instead, they took their skills and they created the YouTube channel and they said, "Let we're going to make a really cool channel where we do videos and these brands come to us and go, hey, can we just sponsor the episode? Can yeah. we just be a, can, if we send you this, will you be a part of the team and just like talk about it's it on your page? Yeah, dude. And it's like, uh, and that, that's really. I mean, look at Mr. Beast. He's literally just got companies throwing money at him. It has nothing to do with what. The- nothing to do with it. And I'm not <laughs> saying that I'm going to be a buttery bros. I'm not going to say I'm going to be Mr. Beast. I'm not saying I'm not. You never know. I have no idea what the, what's going to, what if in you turn. you don't put yourself out there, you never know what's going to be. Exactly. And for a while, I was just very cool with just working with my client, staying low key and doing that. And I still want my low key time. So I have the two phones. I've talked about that many times. Yeah. So I'm still very keen on having that side but now it's like i'm back to the point of thinking in that buttery bros mr beast okay we have to really continue to hammer this out get interesting people hang out with them talk give people value yeah have them understand different things or teach them things and then now do the live podcast hang out in the set in the moment i think the coolest thing about that live podcast was that you had people competing in high rocks behind us they were just fucking racing behind us while we're just hanging out and talking And in a world or a sea of inauthentic human beings, just being authentic, being yourself, hanging out, unedited, unbullshit, filtered. If I fuck up on a word, I fuck up on a word. Yeah. I think that there's a lot that people connect with on that front because we're so tired of being Uh, fed a perfectly glistening picture of everything when that's not the case absolutely i say all that to basically say that (laughs) no but that's i think you know like you said you know people want more real people want more raw you know working so and i'll I'll just finish on this like getting we have more to talk about do we have to leave to go to go Uh, pick up your kids yeah i got got, 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 like 25 more minutes all right we got 20 minutes i wanted to hear about some of the stuff that you were doing for the food prep yeah all right so we'll end on that okay we'll we'll do a brief one and then you're coming back for round two all right no problem no we can we can uh we can get into some of the well maybe i want you on round two all right so in short you know go not not settling right like yeah so being someone that for a long time helped people cook or eat better. And then it was like, how do I utilize this like passion that I have for helping people eat better? You know, like, or someone would come over. Always, always, I'm like the house. Football season, Sunday's at my house. You know what I mean? I'll be uh, waiting by my phone during football season yeah. for that. I text. got a brisket in the smoker as we speak. I'll be waiting like, for that text, like, "Hey, Nick, come through." I'll bring I'll be you like, a nice piece. Of I'll be like, "Oh my god, I'm, or- class. I'm already outside, crazy." Are you, are you coming to class on Saturday morning? Yeah. I'll bring a nice. Done. Piece I'll eat it while I'm while I'm getting my ass kicked. <laughs> Matt will be like, "Is that barbecue sauce?" <laughs> no, it's blood. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, <clears throat> you were always the house. You were saying, yeah, just taking like that, even throughout high school. Like now that I look back at it, like high school. You know, whether it was eating or partaking in other things, we did it at my house. Camaraderie, man. Yeah. It's, it's and a tribal feeling. And that's where I think, you know, learning, it's like, I had an opportunity to to work with the Jets, okay? That's what I wanted to be, begin into performance nutrition because everything I did with my cooking was to help me perform better, live better. And I'm a big Jet fan. And so I was like, all right. It's a bitch to drive out there, but it's like you gotta you gotta go for what you want, regardless of the situation. Seize the opportunity. Exactly. So, I I uh, I went through the interview process. I got hired, but I turned the 
the opportunity down because the the money that we we talked about this before we went mm-hmm. on like the money wasn't the greatest, but it's like well then how do I still keep the opportunity? So and then I started reaching out to players directly, and because of that, like because I was able to like get on the phone with a manager or then eventually the player and have a conversation about like who I am and what my abilities are and my experiences and what I can offer, then that was like, they like were okay. Let's just figure out the numbers. Cause we're like super excited about That's this, awesome. you know, and now, you know, whether, you know, and that, even though I was like working with Charlie before and other, other people, like that helps my buy-in with my other clients also. Oh, yeah. Now it's like, oh, he definitely knows what he's talking the portfolio about. Portfolio expands. Yeah. And so, you know, again, just like how much can you put yourself into what you're doing? I think that's the more uh, in the more I, you know, grow up and, you know, now trying to I've I guess created the foundation for my businesses, whether the strength training or the nutrition coaching or the meal prepping, it's like now I can. So like now, for example, I, um, I sponsored Manimal's, uh, event with bone broth. Nice. So like now moving forward, I'll be like bone broth for his events. Like I know someone that I can continue that relationship with that doesn't cost me a lot. But I'm providing value. Some people may not understand the value, and some people be like, "Wow, this is great!" And how do I get more of this? And that's where, again, you know, like, just I think it's just like jujitsu. It's a journey, man. You gotta like go through hard hardships and go through shitty times to figure out, like, okay, maybe now, now I can put my my energy and discern, like what i need to be focused on more than just like that looks cool like shiny bright bright shiny object syndrome yeah you know yeah i i I became i became very uh stagnant in my career path for probably the last uh eight months and uh the last month the last couple of weeks have woken me up again to to month and it's it's really put me back in the driver's seat of just taking taking control, taking charge, and fostering those relationships. Because for a long time, I had a lot of people that I have networked in a lot of different industries. Mm-hmm. And I didn't, as a business owner, I failed myself because I didn't put myself out there. I was so accustomed to people just hitting me up. Hey, I need a video. Hey, I need this. Hey, I need that. Or hey, I need some marketing strategies or blah, blah, blah. And I'd just be like, okay, cool. And like, if we had a conversation, we didn't follow up with it. I just kind of like, Okay, they'll hit me up. They have my number. But you have to remind yourself that that's not being a go-getter. No. That's not that's not, you know, championing championing your business. That's not taking it at the helm and going, "No, no, no, like I need to stay on top of this relationship it's and continue to grow it and so this so easy to get stagnant and comfortable, yeah. man." So, I'm I'm glad that I've learned this lesson now versus another year or two years or three years, whatever have you, and then you're sitting there really just going, "What happened?" Whereas it was just kind of like a drifting period of, okay, we're shooting the same videos for the same company and we're doing this, we're doing that. It's like, great. I'm happy that I'm happy that the check comes in every month and it's great, but it's like, we're not growing. We're staying very stable, which is good, but not. So if you don't have five of those companies that you're working with, yeah, I mean, what happens when they go back? And so you learn these things and every business person has that has that pitfall that they have that we're either going to take this challenge and rise now and change things up and do things a little differently and really be a business person. And not that you're going to be more salesy or whatnot, Mm. but you're going to offer value. Oh, you have a company. Oh, you have a business. Oh, you're not out there like that on socials or whatnot. We have to give you a name. Like we have to put you out there. So this way, not only are you paying me and I can help you, but the help is actually going to be more sales or more exposure Correct. or your own podcast or what have you. So the new thing for me is getting back to that point of 
reaching out to people and like really reaching out, just being like, Hey, yo, I, I know we, you know, we, you have companies, you have this, you have that, you have this person that probably needs stuff done. If there's ever anything that I can f help out, if there's any value that I can add and in return, work a relationship out where we're doing something regularly, let's do it. Because when I lost that, you lose your edge. Yeah. You lose your edge and you have to claw back a little bit to get it right back. Absolutely. You know, because yeah. there was a long time in the bodybuilding world, I was just so busy that, I mean, I didn't have to reach out. I didn't have to reach out to anybody. And skills or not, what have you, which is like my name was at the forefront for the list of people to hit up. And it just happened that way. But by kind of just letting things fizzle out because one person or one mm. company comes and they're the, they're the majority stake of your attention and you lose attention on the other ones, it becomes tough. So I'm rebranding the company. I'm rebranding myself. I'm not just doing the production stuff. I, it was Rizzles Productions was the company name for a long time. I think that was cool for when I started. Now it's going towards more media group, Rizzle Media Group, because I wanted to, the whole, the whole drive is to be a group. Correct. Is to have people that work for me. Yeah. Because just like you said, you have a strength and conditioning coach. You are a strength and conditioning coach, but he probably fills a lot of the gaps that you have as a, as a strength and conditioning coach. Whereas he may be learning different things that you know are beneficial to your clients. It's like, well, now I don't have to worry about that side. He's killing it in his, in his field and he's working with me on this. So now I can focus on the things that I'm good at on the other side, right. whether it's the chefing it up or yeah. the, the, the behind the scenes of networking and calling out to the, the individual players and whatnot. So having the team where everybody does what they're really good at, that is what scales a company, yeah. not me slaving away doing it. Oh, the shooting, the audio, the editing, the coloring, the drone work, the this, that, the relationship building. It's like you spread yourself thin. You can only be good at so many things. Yeah. I think also along the way, you know, whether it's a group, but, you know, maybe having pillars in your life, like whether it be a coach or, you know, a nutritionist, you know, like you're saying, just being able to rely on other people because you're grounded in yourself also. You're not all over the place scattering. Because it's tough, man. When I'm out at shoot sometimes and I have a backlog of edits to get done, it's like it would be, I know people hire me because of my vision with certain things, but if I have a team that I they understand the vision, oh, it's okay. So much better. Yeah, so it's like I can be out doing things and the edits are getting done versus, oh, if Nick's not at his computer, the edits aren't getting done. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a tough pill to swallow, man. Yeah. It's tough because you have to, you have to, you have to, relinquish control to gain more yeah absolutely that's the biggest part about being a business owner is learning how to work on the business not in the business yeah and i've been in the business since it started so i'm at that point where i'm like okay even with the podcast i want to have a guy that handles the audio and the cameras and i want to yeah. do i want to get back to doing the live i only did a couple live streams it was way too much work though because yeah. like this is enough and then I hooked the cameras up to this and I had the, the, the I had, this is my old office. I had my desktop here oh. with the camera switcher. Wow. So every time my, my guests would talk, I'd switch the camera <laughs> and I'd switch it back or I'd switch it to this. It was like too much to try. That's a lot. On and I'd brain, be reading bro. the chats. And, and you're I, trying to listen to the person. <laughs> I do what I'm trying to do, which is like yeah. actually be a host. Yeah, that's awesome. So it just became too much. So I'd like to have somebody that is off camera doing their thing, like a Jamie. And you will. Yeah, in, in due time. time. In, in due time. time. Yeah, man. How can people get in touch with you if they want to reach out, if they want to talk to you about either your services yeah. or just see your page? So uh, the food the food stuff is uh, buff on a budget because <laughs> everyone's got a different budget. I'm on a fucking budget right now. <laughs> fucking, these prices are killing me. hundred something dollars for uh, a bag and a half of groceries. Dude, it's fucking brutal. I think peanut butter is 90 bucks now. That's what I feel yeah. like. You know, and, you know, just to touch on that, like I think that's where – my my services are starting to be utilized more and people are starting to uh realize obviously like how you know whether you're in a combat space or in the bodybuilding space like you know supplements cost a lot of money you know food costs a lot of money you start to learn how to like eat right by learning like okay this i can supplement with this food or you know, like, for example, the black cumin seed oil, you know, that thing hits so many things. So, like, you don't have to take fish oil or other things that maybe, like, vitamin C. You better stop whispering when you're giving vitamin gems. Uh, <laughs> he starts whispering when he's oh, giving the gems out. He's like, get, black cumin seed oil. <laughs> the black cumin seed. 
or like for example liver supplement you know like organ supplements right what heart and soil uh i go with paleo valley they have an organ complex that i really like okay it's heart uh, brain and uh liver and it's good yeah i mean the Do like you actually feel a difference or is it is it mostly placebo um, I would say I would definitely, you know, so like as a parent of two very rambunctious boys, I definitely feel the difference. <laughs> <laughs> and being able to still do jujitsu. Yeah. You know, like you can definitely feel the difference when you're not on your protocol versus on like, for example, I, you know, I usually don't do back to back days of jujitsu. So yesterday was uh, six days I, I was wrong yeah, six days six days a week back then i could like 10 years ago I'll, your age I white, white belt no blue belt purple oh, belt but now me. but now like you know now it's like uh, first of all i gotta mind who i'm going with and like yeah you know well, i'm not, flattered that you roll with me yeah you should be no, <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> but you know it's uh, that because you have some restraint you know like dude i fucking I've had to hurt some people, unfortunately, or just like completely walk away from rolling because I'm going to really hurt somebody yep. intentionally. Sometimes it's intentional. Sometimes it's not. I have to tell you that once we cut these cameras off, I'm going to tell you a quick story. All right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. What I was saying. You're saying you used to, you, you can't train back to back days. Yeah. So like yesterday I went to kickboxing and no gi which I really hardly ever do no gi now. I don't think I've ever seen, I've never seen you outside schedule, of a gi. Though. So like Tuesday, Thursday, I'm teaching. So Tuesday night, Thursday night, I can't go to the no gi class. Thursday afternoon, I'm able to now with my schedule sometimes get over to Sarah's. So yesterday I went and I did some kickboxing rounds with Joey Beans. Oh, and he's a monster. Bro, I just like everything hurts he's a monster man i roll with him and i go please just please he's don't so hurt me so I'm like please don't hurt me <laughs> Beans is probably one of the best people at sarah's like long term like has always been you know like there's people that like like palacino over the last like three to five years i would say has like erupted but before that he was like normal like i could roll with him and i could have an opportunity to like do anything now it's now like, it's just not yeah. even fun you know he, the way he shoots across your neck with a with yeah. a rear naked you're just like <laughs> or oh your my jaw or whatever yeah, but he, got my jaw, he got my jaw in one and my mouth was open around oh. this thing i went like this i said dude my like, dental's yeah, not that good exactly. we're not doing yeah. that shit i said i'll take the fucking tap exactly. i'm good please but that, again you know so that's that's where you learn how to quickly be humbled yeah so and i'm cool with it i'm cool with getting humbled it's cool with me so it's it's just do you want to uh, shout out the strength company? Yeah, so it's just Lambden Strength and Nutrition. I was about to say it's Lambden. It's, I, I yeah. wanted to know the pronunciation yeah. of it. Well, in Hebrew, it's Lambden. 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 No, it's Lam Lambden Strength and Nutrition. And I, you know, I've been trying to be a little bit more uh, active with my content. Now I got uh, I'm working with this kid. He's a football player, so we're doing a lot of OTA stuff, getting ready cool. for football. He had a killer baseball season. That's awesome. Went all conference. Proud of the kid. Yes, awesome. getting text messages. Building up champions, bro. Bro, I got a text message from his dad the other day that he's like, he's like, he's fucking mauling people. <laughs> I'm like, let's fucking go. Yeah, you know, like, I love it. I got brisket on Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> so I appreciate you coming through yo, and hanging man. out with me, dude. For real. You're the fucking man. We'll definitely do this again. We'll you let me, some. dude, you let me know anytime. The studio's always open to have you come through chill. Maybe we'll do live events somewhere. Yeah. It'd be, it'd be, it would be great. Um, everybody. I'll put all your social links in the, yeah, in the description. I'll put everything there. But I appreciate everybody for listening to the episode. I hope you guys learned something. Please share, like, subscribe. Yeah. It helps to grow the channel, grow the numbers, do all that. Uh, but for now, I appreciate all y'all for fucking with us. But for now, peace.